So welcome, everybody. Uh, this is a new medium, but uh, an old type of program. I'm Zach Miller. I'm the head of the investor community here at OutCrowd. We, uh, we have an ongoing program, which we call Teaching Tuesdays, uh, where we highlight some of the, the biggest and best thought leaders here in the, in the Israel economy and, and beyond. We focused on companies. We focused on the investment process. Tonight is going to be something a little bit different, but I think it's going to be an event that everybody is going to enjoy. Uh, joining me on this program are Daniel and Yariv from Space IL, um, who are going to be talking about their grassroots space program. Uh, before we do that, just a little bit of housekeeping. Again, I'm Zach Miller here at, at Our Crowd. Uh, if you're not familiar yet with Our Crowd, we're in a, in a crowdfunding investing platform. We have over 4,000 investors from around the world. We've invested over $50 million in 40 different companies, startup companies. We, we have a team here on the ground here in Israel. We look at lots of uh, what we believe to be some of the most aspiring and best Israeli technologies. We invest in them. It's not a Kickstarter or Indiegogo campaign that we'll talk about later on that Space IL is going, is, is running right now. Uh, we invest in these companies and our, our goal is to help these companies and help the Israeli economy grow. Um, that's sort of a shared aspect that we have with Space IL. Space IL will talk to you about their aspirations. It's not only getting a spacecraft and landing it on the moon, um, but it's actually to create sort of the, the framework and the underpinnings of an Israeli, uh, a new type of Israeli space program. Uh, this, this program is being recorded and we'll send out an email to the people who have signed up via email beforehand. Uh, if, you, if you didn't sign up via email and you do want to access to the recording, uh, please drop me a line at Zach, that's Z or Z, depending what, where you are from the world, A-C-K at OurCrowd.com. And uh, we'll send out a link to this video and more information about the about our crowd and Space IL as well. So without further ado, um, I'd like to turn it over. This is going to be a conversation. Um, I'm going to ask some questions, and Space IL is going to, going to respond in kind. Uh, if you do have questions for the guys, let us know. We either bubble up your question uh, to the top uh, window up here above the, uh, the program, uh, or we'll, we, may, we may put you on the, uh, on the program as well to ask your question live. I think that would be really cool. So without further ado, my first question, and, and you guys take it away from here, can you talk about the genesis of the Space IL program? Uh, you know, where was where was the spark? Where did the idea that you know you guys are gonna with with modest means gonna launch a spacecraft and land it on the moon? Can you talk about where this idea came from? Hi Zach. Well, first of all, thank you for for having us and thank you for everyone who joined. And we'd also like to thank Bezek, uh, one of our sponsors, and uh, for a commercial company to invest in a, in a non-profit like Space IL or to. Uh, support such a program, it's, it's not an easy thing to, to accomplish or to, to think about uh, something that uh, in, in those magni orders of magnitude, and we'll talk about it. Uh, we, we started three and a half years ago, uh, basically three young uh, engineers sitting up in a bar and th thinking about putting Israel on the moon. Uh, but since then our mission grew much bigger than just putting a spacecraft on the moon. Today we have more than 250 team members, volunteers, more than 20 full-time employees. And our vision for the future is to make an impact on Israel. Uh, we'll talk about it later on, but when we first got started, we were three young engineers without a shekel in our pockets, thinking about joining a race, uh, the Google Lunar X Prize race. And the first thing that we did was to approach some of Israel's leaders. And everyone who we approached had the same approach, the same uh, Israeli tachles, uh, uh, um, way of thinking and they all said the same thing guys we are with you we'll help you to reach the moon to the moon I can tell you about how we met uh, professor Ben Israel the, the chairman of the Israeli Space Agency three and a half years ago we sent out an email to professor Ben Israel and we wrote him dear professor Ben Israel uh, we'd like to talk with you about putting Israel on the moon now think about three young engineers in the States sending such an email to the uh, director of NASA Luckily, we got a meeting, and sure enough, 15 minutes into the meeting, Ben Israel told us, listen, guys, you're still not there, you're still not quite there, you still have a lot to learn, but I see your motivation, I see the, the level of enthusiasm that you have, and I'm with you. I'll join your board, and a month from now, I have the, the annual space industry symposium, and I want you guys on stage for 15 minutes talking about how you are going to put Israel on the moon. And the same thing happened 
when we approach the, uh, uh, the boss of the boss of the boss of my partner, Jonathan, who used to work for the Israeli aerospace industries, we approach the guy who is leading the, the Israeli space industry, the, the, the uh, director of the space division in the Israeli aerospace industries. Think about the director of the space division in Boeing or Lockheed Martin. And what he told us was amazing. He told us that uh, the same thing, you're still not there, you still have a lot to learn. It's going to be a lot harder than what you could imagine. But as long as I think that you guys have the motivation and I think that you are serious, it is my obligation to help you out. The Israeli aerospace industries have the only facilities in Israel where you can build a, a satellite or a moon-bound spacecraft. And as long as he thought that we are serious, he will help us out on our dream, on our vision. And I think that the, the genesis of, of the project is a bit of a, a Israeli chutzpah and a lot of visionaries who helped us out from day one. I don't think that if we would have tried the same thing in the States or in any other nation around the world, the leaders of, of, the, of the industry, of the academia, would have helped us the same way. Our offices from day one are at the Tel Aviv University for free. We have uh, two pro bono firms, law firms working for us, three accounting firms working pro bono. It's everyone who you approach with, uh, talking with him about putting a, an Israeli spacecraft on the moon, about the impact that it could make. It doesn't matter who you are, if you're an engineer, a scientist, a, 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 a law a company, whatever, you, you'll want to join and you'll ask how we can help. So that's an amazing story. And I know that you've, you, I think you have over 200 people who have volunteered to help you. It's not just the law firms, it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of cross-functional expertise. Can you put your finger on, guys, like what gets people so excited about contributing? So it seems like it was relatively easy to convince people, but what was it? What was, what's so compelling about the vision about going to space? What do you guys think it is? It's, uh, it depends on, on each person. Da Daniel, why, why did you join Space Air? For, for me, uh, learning about the vision to create a new moment in Israeli history, uh, to build a dream into a new moment, a new holiday, uh, we could call it, Yom Chalom, uh, the, the holiday of dreams. Uh, we don't get that opportunity every day in Israel. Uh, so to think about how to build this spacecraft and use it to create something incredible uh, for Israel and for Israelis uh, and for people around the world to be proud of us uh, was, was why, I, why I joined the project. Uh, we go to classrooms and share the story with kids all over Israel, uh, over 55,000 kids in Israel so far alone. Um, when you teach kids about science, they love three things. They love uh, space, robots, and dinosaurs. We have a robotic spacecraft, so two out of three. Maybe we'll find a, a dinosaur on the moon. Uh, if we do, we're going to keep it. Um, but, you know, a lot of our volunteers, their, their inner child comes out, and they just think this is a really cool project, and they want to be a part of it. Um, other people uh, just want to build the coolest engineering project that has ever happened in Israel. So I think that there are three reasons why people love Space AL. Uh, the first one is the, uh, the educational impact that could be created from the project. And we were not waiting for the landing to take place. We already impacted tens of thousands of kids here in Israel and around the world in the States. Uh, so that's the, uh, the, uh, one of the reasons. The other reason is promoting Israel, promoting the Israeli science. So when you're sending a spacecraft to the moon, you're of course making a statement, a worldwide statement. But you could also be spearheading a new industry for Israel. The same way that uh, Unit 8200, Unit uh, A200, created thousands of new startups, startups in Israel. You've got amazing people working today for, for Space AL. And we're not a company, we're a, non, a non-profit. As soon as I land on the moon, for all that I care, or as much as I would like to, I, I want to set them free. Each and every one of that person can open up a new startup in the civilian uh, space industry. And that could spearhead a new industry for, for Israel. Could be another engine for the Israeli economy. Uh, and the third reason is science, is exploration. When you send a spacecraft to the moon for merely less than $40 million of a budget, which is a tiny fraction of a conventional deep space mission, you show that you can do a lot more for a lot less. Suddenly, it's not just NASA or the European Space Agency it's sending out deep space mission emissions to explore the universe. Suddenly smaller countries or even large academic institutes can have their own programs. It's like railways going to the Wild West instead of horses. It, it's, it will start a new uh, uh, space exploration era. 
So these are basically the three reasons why people love Space AI. So that, that's a great answer. Um, I have a follow-on question to that. Um, obviously, Israel uh, has an advanced uh, space industry. Uh, we're one, I think, of, of nine nations in, you know, globally that have the ability to launch uh, you know, some type of satellites into space. Why did this program, in your, in your opinion, why, why did this have to come from you know, the grassroots, from the bottom, from the people? Like, couldn't, couldn't the, you know, the overarching government entities that focus on this, the, the Ministry of Technology, you know, I know they're supporting this, this, this endeavor. Can you talk about it? It's a start. Like, why, why, why did it have to be a start? Great question. I'm not sure that if JFK would have lived today, uh, it would have been possible for him to declare that a decade from now, a man will walk on the moon. I'm not sure that it's uh, in, in today's reality, in today's political agendas, you can declare something like that and not consider to be a lunatic. And uh, you can see the same thing happening in the States. You have a private company, Elon Musk, SpaceX, and their vision is putting a man on Mars. It's not the US government, it's the vision of a commercial company. And it's, it's an amazing era where, where private people, where, where non-profit organizations can think of such a vision and then fulfill it. It's, it's pretty amazing. It's not just one government that can do it. It's a lot of different organizations can, that can aspire to such a, such a dream. Uh, if you ask someone from the Israeli government, of course, they're, they're supporting the program. We have amazing support from the Israeli Space Agency. They're helping us out with the $1.5 million out of their annual budget, which is a, it's the Israeli Space Agency. It's a considerable amount from their budget. Uh, but uh, for an Israeli agency to declare that they're going to send an Israeli spacecraft to the moon, that's, uh, that's something out of this world. <laughs> Amazing. So I think let's use this opportunity now to move into uh, another set of questions and something I think will be interesting uh, to our listeners. So you mentioned in the beginning that there is a prize. There is a monetary prize at the end of all this. Uh, it's, it's sponsored by Google. I think it's about $20 million. Um, can you talk about the nature of the competition? How many teams are competing? What it looks like? Is it fierce you know, competition? Are you guys spying on one another? What, what's, what's going on? Uh, of course, we're spying with Israelis, but uh, <laughs> no, seriously, the, uh, the competition is uh, something quite extraordinary. It's uh, uh, when we first, uh, when I first heard about the competition, I decided to register Space Hail. That's how we got started, and that's when I met uh, Jonathan and Kfir. And when I first heard about the competition, it sounded extremely crazy. Uh, the first team that manages to land the spacecraft on the surface of the moon, make it travel 500 meters on above or below the surface of the moon, and transmit back images and videos in live from the surface of the moon wins a very small and decent uh, prize of $20 million. It's considered to be the largest prize to ever be given in such a competition, and it's also considered to be the hardest competition that was ever created. There are also bonus prizes. Uh, the second team that goes to the moon wins $5 million. Again, there's no bus taking you there. Uh, you don't have to submit academic papers. It's thank you very much for paying $50,000 registration fee. Good luck. May the best team win. Uh, there are also some nice bonus prizes. If you uh, uh, survive for a month in the harsh conditions of the moon, you receive uh, $1 million. If you find water, another bonus. If you find an alien, you can keep it. There's no, uh, there are no aliens on the moon. But there are all kind of uh, those prizes. And that's how we got started, because of that, uh, of that competition. Uh, when we registered, there were 33 teams at the race. Registration was opened for three years. Uh, we're the Israeli team, hence we registered on the last day possible. Registration was opened for three years. We registered on Friday morning, December 31st, 2010. It was literally last day to register. Registration was opened. And now we're down to 18 teams at the race. Uh, we're con considered to be one of the leading teams. We're the only team that managed to raise all the budget that is needed to take it to the moon. And so far, that has been the, the, uh, the real ch challenge of any of the teams at the race, raising the, uh, the budget needed to take us to the moon. It's, uh, of course, it's a technological project, and nobody has done build a spacecraft in Israel. Nobody has built such a small spacecraft anywhere in the world. 
So we expect the budget to increase a bit as we go uh, into the, uh, the actual construction, but still we're at a location that none of the other teams is even close at, at being. So um, just a couple more details about the competition. Um, are all the spacecraft going up at the same time? Is there, is there a, like a due date? It's uh, thank you very much for your registration fee. Let us know before you launch. That, that's about it. Uh, is there a deadline? To build the, the, sorry? Is there a deadline? Is, the, is there a deadline? The original deadline was by the end of 2012. Uh, today's deadline is by the end of 2015. But we expect the, uh, the competition uh, deadline to be uh, postponed again. It's a very hard competition. Uh, regarding a yeah. lunch date, it's uh, basically you can build your own lunch at the shack at the desert. There's one team trying to do that. Uh, you can go and pay Boeing one billion dollar and they will take you to the moon. You, you can actually do that as well. Uh, most of the teams are building their own landers. Most of the teams are also building a rover. Uh, the Israeli team, Space Hell, we're doing it a bit differently. We only have a lander. And basically everybody are trying to acquire a lunch, to, uh, to get a lunch from a lunch provider that will take us roughly tenth of the distance to the moon. The moon is roughly uh, 380,000 uh, kilometers or 240,000 miles. And the launcher takes you to uh, an Earth's orbit roughly tenth of the distance to the, uh, to the surface of the moon. So, um, so, so let's use that to talk a little bit more about the technology. Um, it sounds like most of the team, at least the core team, didn't necessarily have experience in space. Like, how, how did you go about building this, the skill sets uh, to be able to start to even think about launching into space? Uh, well, I think it's, uh, it's related to a lot of, of Israeli chutzpah. Uh, in the military, I myself in the military learned that I can walk 40 miles at night and climb on a on a 30 feet rope in a few seconds. I served in uh, one of Israel's uh, special units. And then uh, I started working for the government as an electronics engineer and in one of those nice units. And then I learned that everything, if you want to create something, if you want to build something, you can make it. Uh, you can bring the right people, you can, uh, you can gather the, uh, the, uh, the information that you need and you can build extraordinary things. And it's the same thing for Yonatan Fear, I think. It's when we get, just got started, I didn't have any space experience. We all three of us are engineers, but Kfir also didn't have the uh, space experience. Yonatan uh, worked for the Israeli Aerospace Industries, so it's always helpful when you have someone on the team who knows how to build uh, satellites and, uh, and spacecraft. But the, uh, one of the first things that we did, besides approaching all those uh, Israeli leaders from the academia and from the industry, was to also gather a team. And when you talk about people, uh, we, you talk with engineers about sending a spacecraft to the moon, they, everybody wants to join. You have to, to hold them off. We have hundreds of resumes, CVs standing by of people who want to join, who want to contribute their time, but we currently don't need them. We have enough sufficient manpower to work on the, on the project. And you've got amazing th people here. We talked about the uh, the Israeli space industry, the Israeli capabilities. If you look up at the stars today, the skies, you'll see thousands of satellites going eastwards, but just a bunch going west westwards. And these are the Israeli spy satellites. And they're not going the other direction because the, all the calculations are done in Hebrew and everything is uh, uh, from uh, right to left or on the other side. It's because it's better to launch towards the east because of Earth's rotation. Uh, but we cannot launch from Israel to the east. Uh, we have a few neighbors that wouldn't really like it if we launched uh, a, a modified ICBM according to, uh, uh, to uh, um, how would you say, uh, to international, to international uh, standards. Uh, anyway, you, you wouldn't want to launch uh, reconnaissance satellites above an Arab nation. So we have to launch them westwards. So for the same launcher, you have to build smaller satellites, 30% uh, smaller. And from that necessity came an Israeli capability of building smaller satellites. And we have those people, those amazing people. It's the same way that happened with Unit 8 at time. You had an Israeli necessity to go into cyber warfare, into building uh, sophisticated computer programs. 
And from that necessities, you had a lot of incredible people with, with amazing skills. And we're using the same skill set in a civilian program uh, to send to build a, a very small Israeli spacecraft. Uh, so you can take the Israeli motivation and the Israeli skill set and you combine them together and you get a very small and powerful spacecraft, the Israeli spacecraft. Uh, we like to say that it's an, uh, a nano spacecraft for a nano, uh, for a nano uh, uh, country. Uh, I have a couple more questions about technology. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that to the, in the chat section uh, to the, on the side, uh, we would love to hear your questions. If you have questions uh, for, for the guys, for Daniel and Yariv, um, definitely submit them now, and uh, we'll hopefully get a chance to answer them at the end of, the, at the end of this program. Um, what were your biggest challenges with the technology? Obviously, you're, 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 you're in the middle of it right now. Can you talk about um, specifics about, you know, what, what were some of the challenges that you guys faced? One of the major engineering challenges is the landing itself. No one in Israel has ever landed a spacecraft or a satellite on another planet or on the moon or any other uh, outer terrestrial object. So we have the capability to build smart, small satellites, and we're using those skills to build the smallest, smartest uh, spacecraft. We can fly it there. We know how to build a propulsion system. We know how to, it's a very big challenge, how to get the spacecraft to the moon's orbit. But no one in this country has ever soft landed anything on the moon. So it's like finishing a, a building of, project. Good at building, not necessarily finishing, right? Exactly. Uh, so we have a team of folks who are focused just on the landing, uh, led by one of our our main engineers, uh, Dr. Avi Barlia. Now, Avi isn't a aerospace engineer. He's a neuroscientist. He's a PhD neuroscientist from the Weizmann Institute, and his task is to teach the spacecraft to take all the data that it's collecting from its sensors and from its optical navigation uh, systems and all of its radar tools to crunch that data in real time and teach the spacecraft to think for itself. The landing mechanism is all automated. Once we get uh, to a certain distance from the moon's surface, we hit a button and the spacecraft lands itself. Uh, it's a, a massive challenge and we, we're very confident that our approach, looking at it a uh, in, a, in a different way, is going to is going to be successful. Uh, another big um, challenge is the, the, excuse me, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask you, I was going to ask a follow-up question. Please. So uh, one of the things I read about on the website, which sounded interesting, is, is clearly there's no GPS in space, right? You can't use Waze uh, to get to the moon. Uh, and you guys have de developed something you're calling SLAM, S-L-A-M. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what that is and, and you know, uh, how that came about? So as you mentioned, that there's no GPS. Once you cross the uh, lower Earth orbit, you cannot use GPS. You can type into a, or Google Maps a moon, and it will take you there. Um, most of the missions that uh, until now reached the moon used a very bulky radar system. And for every pound of, uh, of uh, any system that I'm taking with me, I have to take between three and four pounds of a propulsion system with me, which increases your mission, your, uh, your uh, lander size. And as that size grows, you have to pay more for a lunch, and the entire uh, mission gets a lot, uh, a lot costlier. Uh, so we had to develop a, a, a different technology to land on the moon, to navigate our way to the moon. And it's better to reuse the same uh, uh, devices or avionics or parts that you already have to take with you. So I mentioned that we uh, will be taking images and videos for this, from the surface of the moon, so we'll already have optical uh, uh, cameras, as well as uh, video processors to compress the data to send it back to Earth. And what we came with was an optical navigation system. The SLAM, the uh, 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 synthetic localization and mapping, is uh, uh, a way to navigate once we uh, reach the uh, moon's orbit by uh, looking at the video, at the live feed that we'll be getting from the surface of the moon, we'll be able to pinpoint our location where we are above the, uh, above the surface. And by comparing images of the video, we'll be able to know where we're going and how fast. And instead of using a bulky radar system, we'll be using the same uh, video camera and the same uh, chipset that we already have uh, that will allow us to perform a soft and uh, very accurate landing on the moon. On our way to the moon, we'll also, also be using a, a an optical navigation system. Once we'll reach the uh, moon's orbit, 
uh, we need to uh, uh, calculate our exact location before the SLAM system will be able to go into effect. Uh, we'll be taking images of the uh, surface of the moon. Uh, the, the spacecraft will send out those images back to Earth and we'll compare those images with known uh, images on, of the moon here on, uh, on a database that we have. And by comparing or registering those images, we'll be able to pinpoint our exact initial location. And from there, we go to the SLAM algorithm that will be able to tell us uh, the propagation, how we've moved so far uh, on the, uh, around, the, uh, around the moon. Uh, once we start our descent phase, we'll again be using those cameras uh, to receive, uh, it's not exactly a 3D map, but it will uh, give us the, the altitude uh, of the spacecraft from the surface of the moon. So basically, we'll be using the same technology that we'll be using to take videos and images to navigate all the way to the surface of the moon. And that saves us a lot of weight. And that is one of the reasons we are still a very small spacecraft compared to other uh, uh, payloads that have already landed on the moon from, from China, the United States, or the Soviet Union. These are actually the only nations that already made it to the surface of the moon. We will be the fourth nation to join a, a league of, of empires, uh, you might call them, who made it to, uh, to the moon. So I think what's, what's, what's so interesting is that, again, I think people listening should understand this is, you know, you guys are volunteering your time. Yariv, I heard you're running like three other companies and you guys are all, uh, you know, involved in other things. Have you started to see any spillover from the, uh, the work, the technological work at Space IL into your, into your day job, into your other businesses? I know that they're not focused on getting to the moon, but are, are some of the skill sets transferable or some of the, the findings that you guys are getting to? Are you starting to see that uh, spillover? I think we will. It's not yet. Most of the, uh, we have more than 200 volunteers, but we also have more than 20 full-time employees who are doing the, uh, all the teamwork and coordinating and making sure that everything fits and connects together. Uh, the same thing happened with the Apollo program. You had many people working on the Apollo program, day and night, weekends, weekdays, working on, on putting something on the moon. And afterwards, nobody anticipated the, the, the kind of things that the Apollo program led to, from uh, plastics and composite materials to, uh, to new uh, microprocessors, to, to telemedicine, uh, to instant coffee, grained coffee. And I think that after we land on the moon, and all the people who are involved in the project will have their, their knowledge of how to do their, 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 that part that they had in the mission, we'll see a lot of new technologies evolving and new companies evolve through, uh, around those technologies. But right now, it doesn't matter if you're a volunteer or a full-time employee, uh, you, you're pretty busy in, uh, in, in space AL and uh, working on those things. Daniel, you look like you wanted to add something there. Do you have, uh, did you want to add your own comment? Uh, sure, I, I think that, well, I was going to respond to Michael Porg Porter's uh, questions, uh, they, they're a great segue. The, uh, around your, your questions around our, our biggest challenges, it points to two of the biggest. The management challenge alone to coordinate this whole network of volunteers and all of our full-time staff and all of our partner organizations. Uh, Space IL's strategy is a, a networked one. Uh, we are trying to coordinate as many of these actors in a system as possible and leverage as much existing knowledge, skills, and uh, technologies as we can instead of creating new ones uh, by ourselves. Uh, also, there are all these rallies, so everyone has a lot of loud opinions. And so the, the management challenge there is to keep everyone aligned around a shared vision and uh, strategy. Um, there's some really, really amazing and intense Gantt charts that we could put up on the screen. Next month, we're going to put something like 50 engineers in one room for a week. It's called the design review, and we'll be going through all the design phases of the spacecraft. Mm. And think about 50 loud Israeli engineers in one room. It's, uh, it's not easy to, uh, <laughs> to manage those, that group, but it's an amazing, amazing mission to, to be part of. So. And, and Yari pointed to the current status. Uh, we are entering our, our, our preliminary design review, and several of our long lead items for the spacecraft are already in development. Uh, this year, we'll, we'll enter full-scale development of the spacecraft. Um, we're also negotiate, actively, actively negotiating for our launch. 
uh, when we have our final launch solution, you all will know, and you, we hope that you'll get on board because the once the launch clock starts to tick, uh, it's only going to get more fun and exciting from there. Uh, and finally, uh, Evi Attar asks how they can get involved in Help Space IL. Well, first of all, go to spaceil.com and and check out our mission, our team, our uh, technologies, they're all there. There's also a link to our Indiegogo campaign. We're running it right now. If you go to uh, spaceisle.com, you'll see the, the, the join us now. Uh, watch our video. Uh, join our mission. We're, uh, for $18, you can get a ticket to the moon and send a message to the moon. You can even uh, get our official team polo shirts and uh, put your name on the spacecraft. There's a lot of fun ways to get involved. Uh, the campaign's really about participation. Uh, there's the link. Everyone should check it out. Uh, the campaign is about participation. Uh, we want everybody around the world to know about our mission and to join, our, join us on our journey. Uh, share our story with your communities. Uh, we want to come visit you and share our story with your, your school kids and with your local communities. Um, because we like to say that if we land on the, Israel on the moon and no one knows about it, then we haven't accomplished anything. A fantastic response. So I want to take it back to something Yariv had said. We talked about the Apollo effect, um, and right. I think I think what, what that means is that you envision sort of this as the be just the beginning, not the end of a of a race. It's the beginning of a whole new sort of paradigm uh, and a whole Absolutely. new kind of marketplace in, in Israel. So um, ha can you give us a little bit of color around that? You know, do, do you envision sort of you know, a whole, a whole new industry sort of arising here in Israel, seeded by a lot of the guys that have worked on this project? A absolutely. As, as Yariv mentioned, um, the space program and the Apollo missions uh, resulted in incredible uh, technologies that were developed for Earth. Uh, and we expect to see the very same thing here in Israel, the development of a, a brilliant new commercial space industry. Uh, in addition, we're running our educational programming. We're not waiting for the, the, the landing. We're doing it right now. When kids in the Apollo age grew up watching TV, they saw not just Johnny Carson and the Beatles, they saw engineers and scientists and astronauts on TV. And in, in increasing numbers, they went to become engineers and scientists. Uh, we in Israel need the same impact. We don't have enough engineers to sustain the startup nation and to sustain our technology advantages. We need a lot more kids to become engineers. Uh, and so we're sharing the story to try to excite kids around science and engineering to make science cool again. Uh, Go ahead. I, I like to say that we've, well, gone, into, we've gone into a, a thousands of classrooms in Israel. And you see the excitement. It doesn't matter if you go to somewhere in, the, uh, in Tel Aviv, in the suburbs, if they're religious, if they're Arabs. It doesn't really matter. They all fall in love in the spacecraft. And I've gone to schools myself, and it's amazing to go into those uh, classrooms. And I like to say that if I can impact just one kid from every classroom that we go into, we've made a huge change for Israel. We've created thousands of new engineers for Israel way before landing on the moon. And we once met the, uh, the uh, director of the uh, Israeli Astronomy uh, Association, and they have a really old... Uh, um, um, star Observatory in Givatayim. It's uh, it's uh, it's 100% educational. It's not as uh, they don't do any science there. But even today, when he goes into laboratories and he meets PhDs, uh, a lot of of those PhDs approached him and tell him that 20 years ago their father took them to the observatory in uh, Givatayim, and when they looked up this, uh, the stars, they realized that they want to be scientists. And we're all about that, about that, about creating the motivation and inspiration for Israel's uh, uh, future leaders in science and engineering. So this may be a sensitive question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, given the fact that I live here in Israel. Um, are there women involved? Are you seeing women get involved in the space program, women engineers? Not, not as much as we'd like. It's the same problem with, uh, with engineering, with startups uh, all over the world. Uh, but we have some amazing women on our team. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, Sandy Hefetz. Uh, she's leading our avionics team. She was a volunteer of Space AL for two years. And I know, I know, I'm not sure how her day-to-day uh, uh, -day job, uh, I'm not sure how, how much she spent time there, 
because she most of the time or she 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 was she was more than a full time employee of Space AL as a volunteer, and today she's also a full time employee of Space AL. And you have a, a few amazing uh, female engineers like her in the program, uh, but we would love some more as as much as we can have. It's uh, for us Space AL. It's all about an Israel program. I don't care if you're religious, if you're an Arab, if you're a Jew, if you, it doesn't really matter. If you support Israel and if you support Space AL, then uh, if we need you, we'll gladly accept you. So, so you guys mentioned, um, and I've read about a lot of the educational work that you guys do. Uh, you go into classrooms, you get people excited, kids excited about, about the opportunities uh, to not only learn about space, but to be a participant in, in building uh, the race to space. Um, can you talk about what some of those educational activities are? Obviously, it, you know, the headline is very exciting. It's great. I mean, how, how are you helping to change people, I guess, from an educational point of view? Just the excitement sure. is one thing. That gets people motivated. But, you know, are you going to see sort of, you know, the, the emergence of more, uh, I don't know, university programs around space travel? Can, can you guys talk about how exactly. you envision that in the future? Great question. So yes, we've been in a classroom, we've gotten a bunch of kids excited, but then what? Uh, we know that there's a lot more to go. We are partnering with educational nonprofits all over Israel to uh, build longer term multi-part curriculum. For example, we're partnering with Israeli NGO Tasieda to run a course all over Israel called Sky is Not the Limit where kids learn about space and science and, and entrepreneurship as well as Space IL as a case study. Uh, all over Israel and then develop entrepreneurial ideas around space. That's just one example. Uh, we're working with the Davidson Institute at Machon Weizmann to build deeper multi-part science curriculum featuring space IL so that when kids learn about physics, uh, they'll not be learning uh, just theoretical material, but they'll see what their Israeli spacecraft is doing and, and get really cool applied material. We're doing stuff outside of the classroom. We have uh, an amazing partnership with BrainPop. They helped us develop online curriculum and videos. So many of your kids may have watched Tom and Moby. You can see it on our website. Um, we want to reach kids wherever they are, whether it's in the classroom or at home or after school, and ultimately give them entree to activities and challenges and videos and maybe even a video game we're working on with the Schusterman Foundation and Games for Change. Uh, we're working uh, on uh, cross-platforms so that we can excite kids uh, wherever they are. In the last year, we've also started a partnership with a US-based nonprofit called the iCenter. They're based in Chicago. They do innovative Israel uh, educational programs in the, in the North American Jewish community. Uh, and that's also a, a, a new area for us to excite kids in the US about science and engineering and Israel at the same time is a really uh, exciting uh, next step for Space IO. Interesting. So what, one question I had, and this is a little bit off subject, uh, it's, it's actually uh, something I'm curious about. Um, I read in the States about Elon Musk and uh, you know, SpaceX and sort of uh, what, what Richard Branson is doing with you know, Virgin Galactic. Why, where is this coming from? Like, can, like why now? Like why is that the next frontier right now for consumers to get into space? Is that just, is that ego or is there, there going to be a business there? I, I, just, I don't understand enough. And I, I'd be curious to know what I, you guys I, I like to say, there's a joke, I like to say that in the, uh, in the 70s and 80s, all the billionaires bought yachts. Then they moved to private jets. And today, if you don't wow. have a spacecraft, then you're not a serious billionaire. <laughs> but uh, seriously, the uh, space is the final frontier. And I think that you see some of those amazing leaders, uh, they see that even for governments today, it's, it's pretty hard. And today you have a lot of power in the hands of, of, of those individuals. And they're also keeping their commercial uh, 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 vision in, in those companies. But in the same time, they're also uh, helping humanity to step forward into space. And it's quite extraordinary. It's quite amazing to see it. It's, uh, it's both, it's a, you know, it's a bit of ego. It's a bit of, of, uh, of something new and exciting. And it's, about, it's a lot about helping humanity, advancing humanity. Uh, a connected cool. issue is Mr. Israel Barkin's question around international regulations around behavior in space and on the moon. Uh, yes, the Apollo landing sites, for example, are international heritage sites, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, if we were to land on the Apollo landing sites, mm -hmm. we could 
face international sanctions or courts. Uh, we must land near them, take a picture of them, uh, and that would be an amazing moment. Uh, all of the Apollo landing gear is still there. The uh, Neil Armstrong's footsteps are still on the moon. There's no wind or atmosphere up there, so they're all. It's all still there. If we were to find one of those landing sites and take a picture of it, that would be an amazing, amazing. moment uh, for us. There's also a bonus prize for that. There are no uh, actual laws, but there is a 50 long uh, pages long uh, document from NASA on the uh, do's and don't do's when you approach an, uh, an heritage site uh, on the moon. We wouldn't be want to be these uh, spacecraft that you know. Uh, dust is off the, the footsteps of, of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. It's, uh, we also like to say that the day after we land on the moon, you'll see a, a UN declaration against the Israeli occupation on the moon, but it's uh, still not uh, an international law. I, um, I don't know where I'm headed with this, but I, what I thought was really interesting was when Red Bull put uh, uh, the person into, into close to space, and uh, there was a meme that was going around the internet, like when you realize that you know, Red Bull has a better, you know, international space program than your country does. Uh, you're in trouble. And it, it's, you guys are sort of coming on the up as, as a, lot of, a lot of countries are, are and in the U.S. especially, has, has, has pulled back on its space program. Um, it's kind of interesting to see, like, this is an entirely new bootstrap model versus, you know, the big government-run, you know, billion, multi-billion dollar, uh, you know, kind of money pit. And that's very much the purpose of the Google Lunar X Prize Challenge, is to democratize space, is to open up innovation in the space industry uh, and create new discoveries, new approaches. Uh, you already mentioned, picture a world where uh, any small country or university or nonprofit or media company can go explore outer space, or for the price of uh, one probe today, we could send 10 or 100 probes into outer space. Uh, we could learn so much more about not only the, the outer space and the galaxies, we'd learn a lot more about our, our own environment here. Uh, uh, just a reminder. Sorry, go ahead. Yes. Uh, I was going to respond to Kalia Natan's question around if we're exhibiting the spacecraft anywhere. Uh, we have a exhibit, uh, I believe, in the Mother Tech in the north. In Haifa. In Haifa. We also have a new exhibit potentially in uh, Long Island at the Avionics Museum. Um, we, we brought a spacecraft, a model of the spacecraft with us uh, two weeks ago to New York for the Celebrate Israel Parade, and we left it there so that it could tour around a little bit in the US. And of course, we have one at our offices in Tel Aviv University. If you contact us and you want to come take a picture with the spacecraft, uh, we could probably work it out. So I, I think we're getting near the end of our session. I just want to remind everybody uh, you know, on the side here, you can submit questions. If you do have questions, we have uh, Yuriv and Daniel here uh, captive, and uh, now's the time to get your questions in. This has been a fantastic discussion for me. I found it very useful. Um, let's now talk about the final phase. Uh, I shouldn't say the final phase, but where you guys are now. So you're, you're busy working. You got the engineers. You guys are, you know, you're going to have this design phase. Lot, you know, 50 Israeli engineers did a lot of hummus and come up with a fantastic, you know, plan. Um, you're also raising money. It's like I, I know Sheldon Adelson came in and supported the project. You have this Indiegogo campaign now. Um, explain how this has been, you know, such a, a grassroots project, and, and how people who, if they do get involved in Indiegogo, you know, can continue to support uh, the on, you know, the ongoing operations of Space IL. <clears throat> so first of all, uh, for a three-year three-year-old uh, Israeli nonprofit organization, Space IL, has grown and developed uh, at an amazing rate. It's a lot of credit to our founders, Yariv and, and Kfir and Yonatan. It's also a big credit to our, our board and our supporters and all of those older folks who saw something amazing and put their reputations and their names on, on this project. Um, we have thousands of people who have supported this project with their time, uh, with their uh, sweat, with their, with their resources, uh, anywhere from 18 shekel on our website all the way up to, you mentioned the Adelson family uh, supporting us with multi-million dollar support. Um, we need everybody to be a part of this. Um, it's, it's critical that, uh, that 
people all over Israel and all around the world see this as their spacecraft too. That means a lot to us that, um, that you all, now you've heard our story, that you go and tell your friends about it, that you get excited about it and you share the story. Uh, and part of that is to take ownership, get, get involved and get your ticket to the moon, send your message to the moon, we'll take it with us on the spacecraft. Um, we want to hear from you. We want you to be a part of this because that's part of our overall mission. Uh, if we do this work right, um, we'll have a, an even bigger movement of folks who are, are with us. Um, Space Isle is really unique. Most of the funds we've raised until now um, have come from Israelis in Israel, a native movement of philanthropy and support. You see Bezek, we're at their offices. We needed a strong enough internet connection to host this feed. So we called Bezek and they said, yeah, come on by. They set us up right away. Um, that, that's beside the half million dollar contribution. Of all their support. <laughs> I was going to get there. They're, and they're a great example. Um, Israeli company that says, this is something amazing. We want to be a part of it. We also want uh, our community to be aligned with this. Um, we have uh, major donors who have uh, done amazing things to further this project, not just with their money, but with their uh, support, influence, and time. Uh, these are all really crucial elements. Um, so we're proud to show the world uh, a new model of Israeli philanthropy. It's something that I think has really caught us all by pleasant surprise. Uh, and now we are taking the, the fundraising efforts uh, international as well. That's part of this Indiegogo campaign, to tell our story in English, to uh, share it around the world uh, on an international platform. We hope you all check it out and share and get involved. Um, and so we still have further to go. There, there's the link. We still have further to go. We've come a very long way. We're, we have enough funds to secure our launch, to build the spacecraft, um, to uh, hire a lot more staff and grow. Uh, but we need more funds to finish the job and, of course, to uh, implement all our educational programming. Uh, the sky really is the limit here. Um, and we have so many more things that we will and can do. Uh, as we continue to build our donor base and um, and to grow, I, I I just love the ambition and I love how it dovetails with so much of what we try to do at our crowd from an investment point of view is identify you know leaders as yourselves technological leaders motivational leaders people are going to put big ideas to paper and actually get them done and uh, you've done it in an amazing way and 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 we're really excited to to, to be a part of this. Um, I know Thank you. we're nearing the end of our session. Uh, there is another question. Uh, Donnie, if you want to put that up to the top. It, there's a technical question. So um, it has to do with how you're going to land on the, uh, on the, on the surface. Uh, you guys want to address this one? With pleasure. So basically what you see in the models that we released to the, uh, to the general public, you see a few engines, a few thrusters at the bottom. Besides that, you have another attitude control system. Uh, these are smaller thrusters uh, that are not fueled from the uh, uh, bipropellant system that we use for, uh, for the main thrust, uh, but they are uh, uh, using something that is called cold gas. It's compressed gas, and by uh, opening and closing those small thrusters, you can change the attitude of the spacecraft. Uh, it's not only for the last part. On your way to the moon, you have to make some trajectory connect correction maneuvers and for those, you need some very fine tuning on of where you're heading. Once you start the large engines, the large thrusters, you have to be pinpointed at the exact location where, to where you want to be where you want to be headed. Otherwise, the corrections, the next corrections, will cost a lot more in fuel, and fuel is very expensive. It's most of, of the weight of the spacecraft is my fuel, so everything has to be uh, very precise. So. Again, I cannot use wings, there's no atmosphere, there's no air up there. I have to fire smaller engines to make those rotations or attitude correction maneuvers. And for the landing, we'll be orbiting the moon moving roughly two miles per second. It's extremely fast. We have to burn most of our fuel to slow ourselves down. Uh, we will be spinning. It's the, uh, that is the uh, optimal way to approach the, the lunar environment. Uh, there isn't even gravity on, there is gravity, but not even gravity on the lunar surface. So it's even more complex as we approach the surface. Uh, we'll be burning fuel and spinning. Uh, we'll slow ourselves down to a steady hover, of, uh, maybe four or 10 meters above the surface of the moon. Uh, once our slam system kicks in, we'll be looking for the ideal landing spot um, 
that doesn't have rocks or craters or other hazards. And once the spacecraft identifies that landing spot, it'll cut its engines, uh, upright itself, cut its engines, and gradually float down to the surface of the moon. Uh, this moment of soft landing is going to be an amazing moment in Israeli history. We're going to be dancing in the streets of Tel Aviv. We already have the permits from the Iriya, so come join us in the streets. Wow. And we hope that people all over the world will be joining us as well. Um, and most importantly, it'll be the kids watching at home, uh, that they'll see a moment that they'll never forget, just like uh, folks around the world uh, always remember where they were when uh, Neil Armstrong stepped foot on the moon. Yuriv and Daniel and the entire team at Space IL, thank you so much for uh, for joining us tonight on the uh, this Teach In Tuesday, which is something we do with with a lot of Israeli technologists. It's been a wonderful opportunity to uh, to learn more about what you guys are up to. Thank you. We hope you all have enjoyed it and that you're inspired enough to join our mission and share right now. Thank you so much. And with that, we'll we'll call it an evening or or afternoon, depending where you're joining us uh, th this afternoon or this evening. Um, that was Space IL. Uh, as I mentioned, to, if, if you came late to the episode, uh, we are recording this. We will make this available. Uh, if we have your email address, we'll be sending it out via email. Uh, if you want, if, if, if you haven't yet given us your email address, uh, you can send an email to me or you can tweet at us. We've, we've given the you know, our Twitter handle out throughout the, the session. Uh, my email address is Zach, Z-A-C-K, at ourcrowd.com. You can email me there. We'll make sure that you get a, a recording of this. Uh, don't forget, there is an ongoing Indiegogo campaign. Uh, so you definitely want to go check that out. And, uh, you know, if, if you're interested in investing in the best of Israeli technology, come back to our crowd and, uh, and sign up at our website. It is for accredited investors only. And uh, once you're inside, you'll get access to, to other, you know, very interesting, very compelling technology stories as well. And with that, I'd like to sign off. Have a good evening, everybody. Lala Tov. Lala Tov. Lala Tov.